Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Mr. Dennis Hurley of the Magnificent Kid History Site Museum of Jerseys and Mr. Eddie Omani of IrelandSoccerShirts.com and author of Green, White, Orange, The History of Republic of Ireland Soccer Shirt, 1921-2021. As we look at the Republic of Ireland kit of the 1990 World Cup, this video is separate from a podcast series and will act as a companion piece for the blog presentation uh, for the Republic of Ireland 1990 kit. Welcome to both of you and thank you for your participation in this interview. Thanks uh, for having us on. Lovely to be here. Yeah. So uh, let's start off by introducing yourselves and the start of your passion with kids. Can I go first, Eddie? You go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, my name is Dennis Hurley, and as Shahan said, I run Museum of Jerseys dot com, uh, which is a site kind of dedicated to, like, like Shahan said, the history of kits and you know any new developments, and it, it's just basically uh, somewhere for me to celebrate kits um i i find that they're they can be seeing a kit from a particular period can be very evocative of that time it helps to ignite ignite memories um and for me personally the 1990 world cup and that ireland shirt was where it all began for me it was it was the first shirt i had and recently um as part of a, a kind of a, a tidy up of the house i came across this photo just for visual proof so there's me at the age of six with a homemade captain's armband because Mick McCarthy was my favorite player uh, and I had the number four on the back properly done because the Ireland shirts were made in a factory in Cork where I'm from and my father knew someone working in the factory who was able to do the correct printing unfortunately the shirt got lost somewhere along the way it would be great to still have it uh, I might have ended up with a collection to rival Eddie's but that World Cup definitely just as well as making me interested in, in football and made me interested in football kits, just the the different colours and the way teams said first kits and second kits, and it's just grown and grown since then. And definitely with the internet, it's really helped to come into contact with, with like-minded um enthusiasts. Well, Dennis, I'm, you're probably shining at a bit of a disadvantage in that you're talking to two Irishmen probably of a particular age. So it, it might be difficult for people who are watching to understand exactly what Ireland was like in 1988, 1990. And if you were 10 or 12 or 14 years of age, maybe like Dennis is, it's very hard to quantify the impact that that Irish team had. Uh, and when Dennis speaks so well about the emotive nature of the jerseys, if you show this to any Irish football fan, you're immediately brought sense of place, sense of time, the emotion, the fabric, the memories. Uh, and it, it's funny that for people who aren't enthusiastic about football kits, it's very hard to try and adequately explain just what a jersey or a or a a shirt or a kit means to people, and I'm I'm very much the same as as Dennis and probably lots of other Irish people or football fans around the world. That first experience of a a major tournament or your team doing well, once it captures you, it's it's very hard to let it go, no matter no matter how old you get. Yeah, so. Let's discuss this 1990 Republic of Ireland kit. When was it designed and, as you, and the occasion for its use? Well, um, Dennis is probably the man to speak about the, the specifics of everything like that. Yeah, well, as far as I can find, um, I, I did an article last year, uh, basically that kind of, over, over the years, there has been a shirt that has kind of, been a, a source of mystery for a lot of people 
a lot of Ireland kit collectors and people with an interest in Ireland kits. And it's basically a green, white and orange version of the 1988-1990 West Germany shirt. And people never, no one ever kind of knew why it existed or where they come from. And then I came across a newspaper article from 1989, uh, a picture in, in, a, in a, a national paper saying, this is the shirt that Ireland will wear against Spain in their World Cup qualifier next June. But apparently, Three Stripe International, who had the Adidas license um, in, in Ireland and who produced the kits, had apparently just decided themselves that this was going to be the new kit and they hadn't told the FAI. And naturally, the FAI were not too pleased with this and they uh, vetoed any new kit design. So Three Stripe International were left with a load of these shirts that had been produced and couldn't be worn by the Irish team. And I think that's why a lot of the ones that you see for sale have the old crest with the, the three shamrocks because that was a design that couldn't be copyrighted. And so three stripe were able to sell them as supporters kits. But then it, it wasn't until very, very shortly before the 1990 world cup that this new, this new style appeared. Um, You know, it's unthinkable nowadays that a country reaching the world cup for the first time would you know, not have a big fanfare about the launch, but it just appeared in one of the friendlies um, very shortly before the World Cup. And I think part of the reason for that was probably because Three Stripe International were afraid of uh, other companies producing counterfeit versions and kind of um, eating into their profits. So that was probably part of the reason for that. And as you see from, from the shirts that he has on show, it wasn't actually very different from the one that preceded it. Um, basically, it took the, the orange stripe on the neck and it extended that and got rid of the collar and the, the, the white stripes on the arms were removed. And other than that, then, um, the only real difference is the, the, v, the V pattern in the, in the weave. Um, so it was a real case of um, evolution and not revolution. And uh, do you remember how it was regarded at the time by the fans and players alike? I was only I six think, then, so Eddie might know better. Yeah, I I would have distinct memories. I'm probably a, a smidgen older than Dennis, but the back then replica football kits weren't as popular as they are now. So if you look back at old images of Ireland games from probably the mid eighties or from the late seventies on, you wouldn't see too many Ireland jerseys actually being worn at games. And it was the, this shirt in 1988 and obviously the success of the team that launched that kind of, um, I suppose our, the fans association with wearing replica kits. Uh, and that's why probably the 1990 shirts are regarded in Ireland, certainly as the, with most affection, because it was our first World Cup. It was the first time as a nation we were on the world stage. And as Dennis said, that that shirt with the, the arrows or the chevron or whatever way you want to describe it, it when it was launched, I don't think there was a huge amount of um, maybe fanfare like there is now with the way marketing is and social media, you know, I you might have seen a picture of the Irish team pre-stage, but other than that, it just arrived into your local sports shop and it was everywhere. And if you look back at pictures from a lot of people from the 1990s in schools or classes, kids were wearing variations of that jersey. And then when you saw your, your national team and your heroes wearing that on the world stage, that shirt, just it just blew up. And it's funny, all these years later, how popular it still is with with not just Irish fans, but I, I would probably argue that it's a very popular shirt amongst football shirt collectors the world over. Um, so it, it really it really hit a, a kind of a unique mark with with fans, and that still resonates today. Yes, and uh, Dennis, I think this is a, a question more directed to you. Uh, do you remember if this particular Adidas design? was used by other national teams or even club teams or was it unique um i would say yeah it it's unique in in 
in that the for, the exact format that Ireland had it. We'll say other teams had V necks. Not too many had it with the middle stripe like, like Ireland did. And I don't recall too many other kits having the, the Chevron or the V pattern. And I think that comes down to the fact that there was this factory in Cork that had a lot of autonomy in terms of what they could produce. Um, like to, to fast forward four years to the 1994 away kit, um, Ireland had a, a unique design with with white with three three stripes down the middle that ended up being adopted by adidas two years later but at the time it was unique to ireland and there, there definitely was a sense of that that they had a lot of latitude to kind of to go their own way obviously within the the guidelines provided by adidas um uh, as a cork city fan i i I'm lucky enough to have a few Cork City shirts made by Tree Stripe International slash Adidas at the same time. And some of them were, were similar in that they were um they were similar to but different to what other Adidas teams had at the time. And you know, looking back now, it, it, I suppose we didn't realize how good we had it. Um, you know, in an era now where if you're not at the in the very top tier of teams, you're basically being given team wear. And uh, you both mentioned that there was not much fanfare with the launch of this kit. Now, uh, so I, I'm assuming the away kit, the white uh, color kit, was also uh, not received with much. I'm assuming it was launched around the same time, but like you said, it probably was. There was not much uh, hype over it. I'm assuming. I don't, and Dennis will probably know better, but I'm not sure if it was. The white away kit was worn. Um, I have an example of it there. I'm not sure if if this was worn uh, by the team before the World Cup. Oh, it wasn't. Um, no, no. It, uh, I think it was Egypt. That was the first time I think. Uh, yeah, this kit was worn. But uh, I guess uh, in terms of marketing, like you said, that was somewhat non-existent. I'm assuming, uh, like it is today. So the white kit would probably not have been a hot commodity, I'm assuming. Around I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think, and we're talking um, with, the, with the modern technology here, Dennis is in Cork, I'm in Dublin. Shan, you're, you're miles away and we're talking live together and we're talking about football shirts. But if you go back to Ireland in 1989, 1990, it was a very different country in terms of the economy, um, maybe the, the mood of the nation. Uh, uh, there was no social media. There was no aggressive marketing plan. Euro 88 was our first major tournament. And I nowadays, the kit launch is preceded by um, build-up, hype, pre-images. Uh, and then you've got the star players wearing the shirts looking immaculate. I certainly don't remember, bar maybe the kind of stock images of the Ireland squad being photographed on a one-off event. You, you didn't really get that sense of expectation before a shirt was released. Uh, and it certainly didn't have that kind of build-up. And like you said, the first time the white shirt was worn, for many people, it may have been the first time they actually physically uh, saw the shirt. So trying to... Con- kind of tell somebody nowadays about the impact of a shirt it's hard to explain it because we didn't have that build up we didn't have that sense of expectation of what the shirt would look like and what it would would possibly mean and that aggressive marketing so are there any anecdotes or interesting stories about the green home kit Um, it's the, the green, the green, um, the green home kit probably followed on the most distinctive feature about probably the green home kit beside the chevrons was actually the number, the font, um, and the, and the fact that a lot of the details, the badges were kind of sewn onto the shirt itself. Uh, and Dennis alluded to the fact that this shirt or these shirts were actually made in Ireland. And I suppose if you, if you look at, we're talking as said about technology, 
but it was a, probably a source of real pride. And Dennis will speak more to this, that the actual Irish shirt was still made in Ireland at the time. And it was made in Cork and it was made by local people. So the shirts that, that Mick McCarthy and, and Packy Bonner and Ray Houghton wore, they were actually made in Ireland. And I know that sounds like a, a strange kind of concept, but nowadays everybody is used to the fact that kits and shirts are made in different countries and mass produced and exported in. But to have a shirt actually made in Ireland, um, and as a Dennis will probably speak more to the fact of how important it was to Cork, but it's a, it's a fantastic legacy to know that the shirts on the biggest stages when Ireland ever played uh, were actually made in Ireland. And I think in hindsight, that, that makes them a little bit more special as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is right there. Um, it's only when you look back, you, you kind of realise just how, how unique a situation that was, or especially compared to nowadays. It, funnily enough, there were South American made versions, um, and I'm not sure why or how they came to be, but they actually had a, a, a button up collar and no Adidas stripes. And the Italy team did a, a squad photo before the World Cup with each player wearing a kit from a different country. And I'm not, I forget which it, Italy player had it, but he was wearing one of those shirts. So th- that's a kind of a, an unusual anecdote, but I haven't, I haven't got to the bottom of that. And the only other interesting fact is that um, Eddie mentions in, in his book that Ireland said had this shirt by 1992, the, the numbering had changed, but for the US Cup, it be it was the first Ireland shirt to have a number on the front. Um, the the crest had had been updated by then as well. Yeah, and funny enough, it was Ireland played England obviously famously in uh, Italy in 1990, and we wore this number on the back of the shirt. And by the time we played England again, I think in a qualifier, Dennis, might, I think it's probably November. Yes. Yeah. Um, the number had changed uh, to the to this font, and this was Ronnie Whelan shirt. So there was a slight, uh, there was a slight tweak in the changes, and I suppose Dennis alluded to the to the goalkeeper shirt, which we were very fortunate to have a a, a goalkeeper who was so prominent on one of our or a couple of our best days. Uh, so the yellow version of the kit, as worn by Packy Bonner. This is actually Jerry Payton's from the US Cup in 92 with the front number. But this yellow kit um, is probably synonymous to anybody in Ireland over the age of 38. You show them this uh, and they're immediately brought back kind of 30 years. And it's funny how that kind of imagery stays in people's minds all these years on. Yeah, it was was very popular because... You could buy box sets of the home away or goalkeeper kits, and the goalkeeper ones came with the number one on the back in that three stripe style. Um, so they were really, really popular Christmas nineteen ninety presents. One of the one of the unique aspects, I think, of the the World Cup in nineteen ninety, besides the home kit, was a kind of iconic grey goalkeeper kit that Packy Bonner wore against Romania, and. Uh, Traditionally, the Ireland goalkeeper wore a yellow kit. We didn't really have much need for an away kit. Um, And so this particular uh, goalkeeper's kit was particularly iconic. And one of the unusual features of it for the people who like their kits is that they did release a couple of replicas, uh, I believe, shortly after the World Cup, where the, the three stripes went up to the neck. Yeah, yeah. There's quite a lot of distinctive features between the replica with the smaller crests, the sewn on badge um, and the sleeves. Actually, funny enough, I'm not sure if you're if you can pick that up. The the fabric of the sleeves were actually sewn uh, together. So the sleeves were made out of the body of the shirt. And I believe that was only done with the actual uh, players jerseys, whereas the replicas have the actual stripe sewn into the fabric. So again, there were subtle differences and they probably never saw the need to wear that shirt or to, to use it. 
So the grey one is a, is is a slightly unique piece as well. So what is the one match that this kit is linked to? I, I think Eddie just mentioned it there. It has to be the Romania one, really, because... Oh, because the drama first, and all that. First yeah. World Cup, getting to the knockout stages, winning the shootout, Paki Bonner making that save in the grey kit for the only time, um, and reaching the quarterfinals against Italy. Um, obviously, the... The England game, like it only appeared in two of the five matches at the World Cup and both were special. The first game ever at the World Cup and then the first win. It was a draw, but we won on penalties. Um, so those two would be the the matches. Probably the Romania one slightly more so, I would think anyway. Uh, yeah, the, the the Romania game, as I've watched it back, I don't think it was a particularly classic uh, <laughs> game. The one thing that stood out for me, which I didn't remember as a 12-year-old, was just how good Georgie Hadji was. And him shooting from like 30, 35, 40 yards pretty much every time he picked up the ball. (laughs) And laser, like, I mean, if a player was doing that now, he'd be a, oh, he'd be a 180 million pound footballer. He was, you know, John Aldridge was trying to get him. McCarthy, I think, has the record for most fouls in one in one World Cup game like he he was just un, he was just unstoppable and it, for Irish history and we talk about the jersey and how it means so but for many people that kind of game ranks alongside England in 88 as being one of those just seminal moments where it was like you know penalty shootout and the subplot that has David O'Leary who was not maybe a favourite of, of the manager, Jack Charlton, in the earlier days. A defender scores the winning penalty. Uh, and, you know, if you were in Ireland in 1990, uh, that was a fairly special moment. I know we're talking about Adidas and some of the kits, but uh, this, this tracksuit, after the penalty shootout, all the Irish players and subs and everything run on to to Packy Bonner and jump on top of him. And those memories, certainly for me, maybe Dennis and, and probably lots of football fans, they're just ingrained in our psyche. Absolutely. Now, incidentally, like you mentioned, during this World Cup, the white kit was used more on more occasions. The green was used against uh, England and Romania, while the white was used in three matches, Egypt, Holland and Italy. Or was this because of insistence by FIFA to wear the white as I don't remember, you know, there was any significant color clashes except maybe maybe against Italy. Would you know that? It it was basically uh, they didn't want dark against dark. So um, against against England, it was fine, obviously, because that was dark against light. Same in Romania's yellow. And then the other three games were against teams who um, Egypt were red, Netherlands orange, Italy blue. So the FIFA didn't want FIFA basically wanted one team to have a light color in every match. And Ireland, Ireland kind of probably got a bit unlucky in having to change in their three dark versus dark games. Um, in the same group, there was the Egypt Holland match. Both teams had to wear their change kits because. Egypt's away was green and that wouldn't be allowed against the orange either. So that game was green against white. Um, so we see a lot at World Cups um, where there doesn't look to be a direct clash, but one of the teams will be in a, a change kit. It was it was probably something that began in the, in the 70s, maybe when more people had black and white televisions and it would be very hard to tell a blue versus red so it probably originated there and it's it's just become the accepted way of doing it now. Yeah, in, in 1988, we played three games and we wore green uh, in in all the games. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a bit of a, a surprise, I suppose, for a lot of Irish fans traditionally uh, over the, the course of our hundred and odd year history. Green has been naturally the, the colour associated with us the most and and as Dennis said those probably three games in the the 1990 World Cup opened their eyes to the fact of wearing 
an away kit because even the away version of this, I think, was worn possibly twice. Um, we we traditionally just wore green. That was it. It was the boys in green, and that was the way we that was the way we rolled. Um, the the chance of wearing the away kit brought up us having to get some of the wearing the the different kind of shorts as well from the World Cup. And in terms of imagery as well, that that number font carried over onto the front of the shirts um, to match the back of the shirts. Certainly for me, it was very vivid. Um, we didn't often see numbers on the front of shirts. I think 88 was, or uh, shorts, was one of the first times. So again, lots of visual contrasts and things that stick in, in people's minds. And uh, at what point was this design discontinued? So it's, it, I think the 1992 US Cup was the final time it was worn. Ireland had actually played their first Euro 92 qualifier in May, sorry, their first USA 94 qualifier in May 1992. And the kit was still used then for a game against Albania. And Albania came to Ireland without any kit because the country was in a bad way. And Three Stripe International actually made them an Adidas kit with the brand new Adidas design with the three stripes down each arm. So Albania had a newer style than Ireland did um, at the time. But for the for the, the next game, the next qualifier after the summer then in September 1992 against Latvia, Ireland were in a new Adidas equipment kit. I presume if they had qualified for Euro 92, the new kit would have been seen then. So, um, of all the Irish kit designs, is this the most memorable memorable one from a historical standpoint? Precisely because of uh, because it's the first World Cup participation. I know Dennis has a, a much more encyclopedic knowledge of jerseys and teams and and everything else. Speaking purely from an Irish point of view, uh, those those moments and I suppose kids are remembered for either the good or the bad thing you know when your team is winning this kid is fantastic if we'd lost 4-0 to England uh, 2-0 to Russia and Holland beat us 5-0 there probably wouldn't be the same amount of memory so uh, likewise again the, the famous orange kit from 97-98 when we lost away to Macedonia the fortunes of the team I think definitely reflects the, I suppose, the fondness in which a kid is held. But as a seismic moment goes, our first World Cup to play England, uh, draw against them coming from behind 1-0. Um, and then even going out valiantly against Italy in Rome, you know, to the, to the tournament hosts wearing our white kit, those moments and those things probably mean that, that yeah, I, I, I would say, I certainly for me, this jersey and the, the 1990 kits, the home and away, and you forget about the kits are one thing, but you have to remember the players Ireland had. Um, you know, we can talk about players, but the likes of Packy Bonner, Paul McGrath, Mick McCarthy, Kevin Moore and Steve Staunton, Ray Houghton, Ronnie Whelan, Niall Quinn, John Aldridge. I mean, you know, we didn't really know how lucky we were to have players of that ilk and a manager like Jack Charlton who was strong enough to mould these players. And um, I, I know you're wondering why on a Friday night I'm wearing a shirt and tie. I don't normally dress up, but I just said uh, as part of the, the night that's in it, this is David Kelly's uh, Italia 90 blazer <laughs> and and tie. So I said, in your honour, Shahan, I dress up, you know, and uh, show the face. But it, it, it's hard to adequately, as I said at the very start of this, explain how much that team, that manager, and these kits and those moments mean to Irish people. We probably need to get over it. We probably need to <laughs> move on to to newer heroes, but the first is always 
it's always the most special. And uh, I think that's why that that kit has such a special place in Irish people's hearts. But again, 30 years on, kit lovers all around the world love the Ireland Italian 90 home and away kits. Do you think younger fans are aware of this kit and its history, or is it just mostly older fans such as ourselves? I think the younger fans are because of that that first World Cup, and I've seen in recent years um, a lot of how should we how should we describe them uh, unofficial reproductions. Um, with the Adidas logo and the Ireland crest, but not actually made by Adidas. They've proven very popular, and some of them are very bad. They have the Opal logo completely incorrect, but they they still sell well. Um, You go to any Ireland match at the Aviva Stadium, and you'll see people wearing original ones and modern reproduction ones. So it w- I think it will always be popular. And the further 1990 disappears into the rearview mirror i think that kind of nostalgia will will hold stronger um just because it was such such a high point for for the country in in terms of football it was it was the beginning of like i know 1988 was was the first time they made to a major finals but the world cup is different you know it's everyone is watching it and it it, it just left such a, an impression um and it kind of just you know it, it led on to, to what followed then yeah. and there's a thing chan uh people talk in ireland about it was the start of um maybe a a, a bounce in our nation's mood in our optimism as i said in ireland in the 80s it wasn't great economically um and for the nation to see us gain success um at the Euros was the first step, but as Dennis said, the World Cup is the World Cup. That's the that's the top table, and we didn't just go and do well. You know, we we did really well. I mean, Italy beat us one nil in their home stadium, and I think that that confidence and mood, and some people say it, it led to a maybe a change in outlook in us as a nation. It raised our expectation levels. Yeah. And you can see it now with other countries who maybe have their first experience of success in a major tournament or major finals. The people believe that they belong and that that they're, they should be at that top table. And for Irish people and Irish fans, football fans, uh, we set the bar very high. And any team that comes along now that's that's where we that's where we expect to be and unfortunately i think in the last number of years we have to realize that they were special times uh different times and we maybe need to what would the right word be here dennis we need to maybe uh evaluate where our where we are in the pecking order yeah of things very true so this next question, I know I don't need to ask Eddie, but uh, Dennis, do you yourself own this kit and how does it rank in your personal question, personal um, collection if you do? Unfortunately, uh, not since about 1994, whenever, whenever my original uh, one went missing. Um, if, if I did still have it, it would be at the top, but I see originals on, on short sites going for about £300 sterling at the moment. So I think it'll have to be uh, on the long-term bucket list. So uh, in closing, uh, not uh, I guess looking at not Irish kit collectors, but let's say the serious uh, kit collectors around the world, how would they view this particular kit and uh, is it would it universally be considered iconic by all i i i personally think it would be international football is different to clubs and that i can appreciate uh lots of different clubs and lots of different things at, at international football of course i can appreciate argentina brazil italy germany um 
but I can also appreciate kits that resonate with me um, of teams we played against. Um, certainly the, the unique Cameroon kit in the 2002 World Cup, for some reason, that, that would be something I would, I don't know, that's a kit that I would like to have, or I, I you know, I think that's a, a fantastic kit. And if I was minded to, to be interested in other nation shirts, yeah, that would certainly rank up there with me. But certainly through um, my own little project here at IrelandSoccerShirts.com, the amount of interest and emails and questions I get from all around the world about the 88 and the 90 kits show to me certainly that it is, um, it, it, it did capture the imagination somewhere. And as Dennis said as well, it was only worn for a very brief period um, and those days are gone so it, it probably has that extra desirability factor yeah absolutely um i i think it, it's uh it, it's it's well regarded inside and outside of ireland um and i think the the demand for it is it, it's, it's holding three decades later and I wouldn't see that changing anytime soon. With that, I would like to thank both of you, Mr. Hurley and Mr. Omani for your participation in this interview. And to remind everyone to please read the main blog article as well for more detail. The link is included on the video upload description along with all our respective contact information so thank you again thanks very much for having thanks, me Shan. lovely to talk to you nice to see you dennis you too eddie